welcome back everyone and welcome to all of those who are who just joined for this session. We will immediately kick it off with a brief introduction of our next speaker, Aisha, and um, she will then take over, walk us through a half an hour something presentation. Then we'll have also some time for, for Q&A. So uh, before I introduce Aisha, uh, a few years back, I, um, I don't even know who recommended the book to me, but someone recommended to me this book, Design the, Love you Lo the Life You Love. And I read it and I was already familiar with uh, design thinking, et cetera. So there were a lot of similarities in that for me or something that I already knew, but I hadn't seen anyone apply these design concepts to what we all share, which is our life. And I found it so inter interesting. So I gave it to my wife and my wife is a dentist. She doesn't do any of the work that I do, but uh, she, she's also an artist. So she really likes to draw, et cetera. And when she saw that book, she immediately like loved it. So, and she started doing the exercises. There was a lot of visualization in it and ultimately made um, some significant changes to, to what she was doing back then. And those changes took a longer period of time and will ultimately end up uh, in her running her own practice um, at some point um, in the near future. So both my wife and I were very intrigued with this. I reached out to Aisha, I think several years ago, um, evaluating whether we could run a workshop here in Cologne. And then at some point COVID hit, and then we got reconnected through a shared friend, Alex. And now I'm more than happy to have you here with us, Aisha, and have you share your experience and your amazing work with everyone that's on this call. And this is one of the sessions that is going to be recorded. So those of you who will receive this recording, also feel free to share it with your friends, because I think the work that Aisha has done and how she connects it to, to everyday life is, is amazing. Now, a few things about her. Um, she's from Turkey. Um, so same region of the world that I'm from. Um, she came to New York uh, af at, after high school, I think, or after university on a Fulbright uh, scholarship, did her master's in industrial design. And um, she then at some point founded her own company, Birsha uh, Plasek. Um, and that's the only design studio that is woman and black owned. And uh, she's one of Fast Company's 100 most creative people in business. Um, she's world's number one coach in life design, which I think is connected to the book that she wrote, uh, the author of Design the Life uh, You Love. Um, and she's done a ton of work and wrote a book, ton of articles for Harvard Business uh, Review, Inc.com, worked with some of the most uh, elite clients in the world, including Amazon, CVS, Facebook, etc. And I'm sure she can share more of that herself. So I'm going to be quiet right now and I'll hand over to Aisha. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. It's so good to be here with you. It's morning in New York. So um, 10 o'clock Friday. Uh, here we say TGIF, thank God it's Friday. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm so happy that uh, Sohrab, you invited me to your session and to meet your community. You've been doing a lot of great work during um, COVID especially, bringing your community together and, uh, and I've been trying to do the same. So um, I feel like we're kindred spirits and, um, and I'm so excited about uh, your wife, you know, designing her life and work and, uh, hopefully opening her own practice very soon. That, so that's super exciting. Well, um, I'm a designer, so a very, very visual person. So let me show my um, slides and walk you through them. Kind of like my, my visual story. But one thing, isn't Michael amazing? We call him MBS. He's amazing, right? <laughs> And he's very, um, very supportive of his friends, of a very generous person. All right, share screen, I say. Oops. There we go. Well, welcome to Design the Life and Work You Love for a New World, because we are now living in a new world post-COVID. And oops, 
come back. This is my family. But first, I just wanted to share my heart with you all. Um, this is my heart beating with excitement at meeting Sohrab's friends and team. And this is my home team. Uh, Bibi, my husband, is at the center. Bibi Sek, who's an automobile designer. He's designed for award-winning automobiles for Renault before um, he fell in love with me and came to New York. And these are our best products, our kids, this summer in Turkey. And this is my home team. Uh, so everybody on our team, except Bibi, um, are women, which is very unusual for a design and innovation firm. But here we are. I'm with um, Seda Eves and Leah Kaplan and Meltan Parlak. Uh, and Céline Sermaz and Yuko Kanai. And we're wearing, as you can see, our hearts, not on our sleeves, but on our shirts. So um, one thing that we deal with as designers and design thinkers is uncertainty. And one day I wanted to kind of work on the idea of uncertainty and started writing it and then realized that the difference between the word uncertainty and creativity is just one letter. So that was kind of like a signal for me that if you want to go from uncertainty to certainty, you have to go through creativity. And that kind of uh, sums up my, my life as an industrial designer. I've been working on many products and you've probably sat in something that I've designed, maybe an office system for Herman Miller. Um, here's one example, just to give you a quick idea of the overlay system. This came out in the market about two years ago and it's about being open and enclosed for one person or for many and to work together or separately and that you can stay tidy on the inside and creative and messy on the inside uh yeah on the tidy on the outside messy on the inside and so this is a very simple system that's quite affordable for Herman Miller that has a few parts with which you can do many things. And that kind of sums up my approach to design. And it's also human centered, um, which I'll talk at length. But this is another system we designed for Herman Miller, the Resolve office system. Or, you know, maybe you sat on a toilet that I designed. Not many designers can say, um, they've designed toilets, and this is one of my um, proudest moments. Um, I was called, actually, by Intramuros magazine, the queen of toilets, which I thought was the best compliment. Um, or something that we've designed for IKEA, which is um, these rocking chairs and stools. Or for Staples, this is a whole collection of um, journals that help you become better note takers. And then maybe last but not least, this is a recent um, project we worked on actually for two years. Um, we helped older people design their lives and from that developed a whole point of view around aging and uh, what 65 plus means. And from that helped develop the brand for Alive Ventures, which is about making companies that help older adults love, work, and live better. So that gives you an idea about my work, but which is quite rich in terms of its width and depth. But one thing that's um, the red thread across all of it is the process. And the process is really this one, deconstruction, reconstruction which comes from my expertise as an industrial designer. So I sat down about 10 years ago and started mapping out how I think. I was like, there, there is some logic to this craziness and really like looked at the patterns of how I think and from that developed deconstruction, reconstruction, deconstruct, taking the whole apart so that you can see what something is made up of 
explore looking at the same parts from different angles, gathering inspiration from different places, reconstruction, putting it back together, knowing you can't have everything and expression is giving it form. And the form in my case uh, could be many different things as you saw from a toilet seat to an office system to an automobile, but it could also be our life. So um, to just capture deconstruction, reconstruction, it spells out or the acronym is DRE, deconstruct, explore, reconstruct and express. And really the, um, if you want, to understand this process and how to apply it. Here's the book. Um, and it's really about applying design process to your life as Sohrab mentioned, which is my really hidden weapon for teaching everyone and anyone how to think like designers. And so if you open the book, it's called Design the Life You Love and you don't need any prior creative experience. So it's accessible to everyone. That's why Sohrab, your wife, who's a dentist could do it. And, and that was really my goal to create a very visual, very approachable book that when you see it and you open to the first page, you're like, ah, I can do this child's play. And that was really the idea here. But my goal behind all this is to remind everyone that we're all capable of thinking like designers. And so it's really design thinking made accessible. And, and here are the simple principles of it that we all inherently have. I just provide the tools to help you practice them. So one is optimism. Uh, no matter how hard the problem, you can come up with a better solution. And designers have, and innovators have this um, optimism. That's what propels us forward. Um, we're empathic. And so empathy for ourselves and each other is really important. We're holistic thinkers. We see the big picture so we can connect the dots in different and new ways. We ask what if questions knowing that sometimes often actually the best answers come from the worst places and we work collaboratively. We build on each other's ideas. And I'm sure as I'm saying these things, you're like, yeah, I do those things. Well, that is thinking like a designer. Um, so you are, you know, natural born um, design thinkers. And, and part of that is also being courageous because it takes courage to imagine the future based on what you know today, it's inherently risky, right? Um, so having a process makes th that idea of imagining the future less risky because it helps you think through things and um, in a um, systematic manner. Again, this is a recap of, and you'll have this video and you'll have the book if you want to get it, but it really is quite simple. And the last bit is my favorite part. It's about being playful. Um, the more serious the project or problem, the more playful um, we need to get because when we're playing, we're not afraid of make, making mistakes. We're like kids. Like if you remember yourself as a kid or if you have kids, um, remember how when we're kids, we, we play and we learn by doing. And we're not worried about is this going to succeed or not. And that's really the spirit of design thinking. So in that spirit, who wants to do a quick uh, design thinking exercise? That's not in the book, by the way. So um, if you all have a piece of paper and pen, I want you to draw yourself as your own life superhero, which you are. I'm just reminding you of that. But with that, that you have superpowers and kryptonite. And let me show you mine so that you have an idea. This is me, you know, in my um, superwoman pause. Let me show you like that. My camera is too close, but you get the idea, right? Um, and my superpower is I can deconstruct, reconstruct anything, but my kryptonite is fear and self-doubt, even with my own process. So I find myself every morning getting up and like for the, for the first couple of minutes thinking like, will I have a good idea today? So um, 
so what is your superpower in kryptonite? And here are a couple of them from the um, Philips team, which we've done this exercise with. So if you want to um, ha you know, have some more inspiration. As soon as you draw it, can you also put it into the chat and say superpower kryptonite? And let's see kind of like what, um, what everyone's superpowers and kryptonites are. And so Rob, I have another 15 minutes, right? So we can lean into this exercise a little bit. Easy. Cool. Easy. All right. In the spirit of being playful, I want to see who is the first person who can put their superpower and kryptonite into the chat. And I'm going to come out of my screen for a second so I can see the chat properly and put in the gallery view so I can see all of you. Wow, so Rob, <laughs> you don't count. <laughs> when the host is the first, that doesn't count. Who's gonna be next? But thank you, so Rob, for getting us started. And I'll say hello to Halil Ozan Ökök. Hi, Halil, merhaba. <laughs> All right, well done, Samantha. And Iliko and Christina. So what's interesting about our superpowers and kryptonite is that we all have them. And so it's a great question for everyone. And it could be, you know, you could be a kid or 90 years old and you can still answer this question. What I like about it is, you know, our superpowers are things that come easy to us and often we forget them, right? So I want to ask the question to make sure that you connect with your superpowers, you acknowledge them. Um, the same thing with kryptonite. Kryptonite is part of our life. It's like um, Superman's kryptonite, that slow, you know, the stuff that the, those crystals that slow him down, right? Um, or our Achilles heel is another word for it. And they're also part of our life. We can't get rid of them. Like I, I don't know about you, but I can't get rid of my fear. I've just made peace with it. So it's, this is also a moment to say, hey, um, I have superpowers in kryptonite and I'm, my intention in designing the life and work I love is being intentional about spending more time with my superpowers, recognizing them, and then managing my kryptonite so that it doesn't um, kind of cripple me, right? Or slow me down. And as I talk, I love this, oh, Ildiko, I love that kryptonite. Am I enough? Wow. Do you wanna talk about that? If you wanna unmute for a second? That you can write a book about that, am I enough? What a beautiful idea. Oh, no, yeah, <laughs> I am not prepared yet uh, to write a book, but uh, yes, I was reading a lot of psychological things uh, in the last year. So, yeah. Mm. Yes, I have a lot of superpower, but uh, each day, each morning, it's the same thing in the mirror. Am I enough? Is this enough? Yeah, uh, it's coming. Yeah. All the way. So I don't know. I have the feeling uh, I'm learning, reading, but then I have more questions and more questions and more doubts. So <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I, it's, it's a beautiful question. And thank you so much for um, elaborating on it. And the first thing that comes to my mind, I'm like, as I think through that myself, I'm like, am I enough? I'm like, no way. And that's the <laughs> beauty of it because. I'm not enough. And that's why I get to collaborate with other people and learn from them. And that's why Sohrab and I are doing this together. Um, and I find that collaboration is 
like especially during COVID, it's been one of the best things about um, finding ourselves in this situation is that it forced us to realize we're we're not enough. We need other people. So, but I'm so glad that you made that um, kind of brought that to the surface. Thank you. And so, Rob, what did this make you think? The the exercise. Yeah. For my own super. I mean. It's one of those things, again, um, I had this coaching with Michael in the previous session. And like within five to 10 minutes, he, he made me like go really deep in terms of some of the challenges that I'm facing. And this was like a very simple question that got me thinking like, ah, okay, so like what my strengths and weaknesses, and I was uh, quickly able to, to, to get there, right? And, um, and this makes you more aware, like asking yourself this question maybe every morning, just raises your level of awareness in terms of yeah. your strengths and weaknesses and, and helps you balance those things out better and just focus more on your superpowers than your, than your kryptonite, as you mentioned. Oh, I love the serendipity of like what Michael did and then what this, how you're using it to complement that exercise. Um, and what you said about the daily uh, using your superpowers and kryptonite kind of connecting with them daily is very useful um, because you can then put daily intentions to that right um, like for me if my superpower is deconstruction reconstruction um, I just need to remind myself that okay fine so everything that you're worried about or you're doubting yourself apply deconstruction reconstruction and true, truly, if I can do that, then I'm on top of my game. And so I think uh, I love that you're kind of thinking about that, the, the daily application of this. Um, before we go forward, I, I love the um, kind of how you populated the chat with your superpowers and kryptonite. And I hope if you read through it, I hope everybody could use that as inspiration for themselves to either think, oh yeah, I also have that superpower or I also have that kryptonite. And again, it's important to, this, this one of my lessons was learning that you can't get rid of your kryptonite. And that's the beauty of life, right? Um, none of us are perfect, but you can get better at managing it. So Oh, Samantha, thank you uh, for ordering the book. Um, I was just curious before I move on, anybody who had an insight just thinking about their superpower in kryptonite who uh, wants to share it? And if you want, you can unmute yourself. I have given you that permission. Cool. Okay. Who wants, somebody take the mic. Whose superpower is it to, to be an extrovert? Come on. All right, then I'll put um, Halil, my, uh, <laughs> my Turkish collaborator on the spot. Halil, talk to us about your superpower in kryptonite. Oh, thanks. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Ali <laughs> is regretting uh, his uh, Turkishness right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, let's say, uh, actually, uh, my superpower is sometimes also uh, a, a, a trouble for me. Uh, uh, I like to look from different angles to anything uh, and try to think uh, all possible uh, outcomes or maybe all possible uh, aspect, aspects of anything. But, uh, you know, sometimes uh, this is uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, hard to do when you just need uh, you, you spend uh, a lot of time and effort for those things uh, but uh, actually that might uh, it might uh, help me 
find the best solutions uh, to uh, in some cases. So I th thank you, Harid. I I'm so glad you made that point, and I think it's a, an excellent one for all of us to uh, this idea that sometimes our superpowers are also our kryptonite. Uh, yeah. One example is empathy. Empathy is a an amazing superpower, but having too much empathy in really like feeling people's pain so much that you can't function can become a kryptonite. And some people do have that. And uh, so this notion of your superpower can also be your kryptonite is an excellent point. All right, on that yeah, note- On top of that, I, I have the, uh, the, the, you know, I, I can't, uh, fight the power of a uh, warm sleep, maybe <laughs> under a tree. And uh, that makes me lazy sometimes. This is on top of that. <laughs> I love that. It's so um, human. Thank yeah. you for sharing that as well. Thanks. And for your courage for uh, letting me call on you. <laughs> so do you see there's a lot of background noise from New, New York. Are you hearing all that? I can close the window if that's the case. I guess it's all right. Okay, so um, I just wanna take you through the book a little bit. Um, so one of the uh, exercises, superpowers and kryptonites are not in the book. It's something that I've developed since then, but heroes are in the book. And it's the idea that um, in life and work, it's other people who inspire us. And I call them heroes. They're not superheroes, but they're people who inspire us. And we notice them because they do something well. So this idea that um, you know, we have heroes that are, are maybe family members or uh, friends, people we work with, mentors or mentees, or uh, you know, people uh, that are part of our life. And then there are also people, there might be people we know of. We don't know them personally, but we know them through the news, media, things we've read about them. So one such person for me, my hero is, um, Marshall Goldsmith. And Marshall, you might have heard his name because he's known as the world's number one leadership coach. But I'm lucky because I know Marshall uh, and I've become friends with him. And Marshall came to one of my sessions, one of my Design the Life You Love sessions in person. And he did this exercise and he said, you know, the people who inspire me are um, Buddha, Peter Drucker, the uh, father of modern management, Francis Hasselbein, who was, who's known as the, the CEO of CEOs. She's like the best CEO, or she was the best CEO in the States or, and named as such by Peter Drucker. And um, Alan Mulally, who was the kind of miracle worker CEO of Boeing and uh, Ford Motor Company. Both companies uh, survived incredible hardships because of him. And basically Marshall said, they're my heroes because they've taught me everything they know without asking anything in return. And so when you do this exercise, I turn it back to you and I say, and I said this to Marshall, I said, what you recognize or see in your heroes are your own values. And our values are, the essence of our life or work design. Without values, we wouldn't know what to choose among many, many ideas. And once um, I told that Marshall, like, this is your value. Um, and then I asked him, so what would you want to do to be more like your hero? And, and he said, well, I want to teach everything I know to others, just like my heroes have done with me. And from that, uh, Marshall started um, 15 coaches, which I'll share with you. But then um, this summer during COVID, Marshall asked me if I would 
coach him one on one? And I said, of course, Marshall. But I was terrified. I, I have to tell you because uh, I was like, I'm going to coach the world's number one leadership coach. How is that going to be? But Marshall is an incredibly generous and accessible person. So um, I coached him over the summer, over um, 10 sessions. And through that, he came up with his next greatest idea, uh, which he's working on now, which is knowledge philanthropy, which is something that I coined for uh, Marshall. Uh, it's the idea of giving away all your knowledge to others without asking for anything in return. So often we understand philanthropy in terms of money, but this is knowledge philanthropy. It's giving away your knowledge. And here is the um, 100 coaches, which is today more than 100 coaches. Um, the idea for this started in my session um, with Marshall thinking, well, I want to teach everything I know to 15 other people. So he started at an accessible scale and then grew that from that. And as you can see, um, you know, uh, Sohrab, our mutual friend, uh, Alex Osterwalder is part of 100 Coaches as well, as, and so am I. All right, that was my signal to myself to stop talking. But, um, <laughs> and open it to Q&A. Um, maybe one last thing, as you come to the end of the book, you might see this vision map. And I've done all of the exercises, so there are a lot of examples from me in the book and in my sessions. And my vision for myself was to become the Katy Perry of design, the life I love. And Katy Perry is a little bit dated, but here really the idea is, the reason that I love Katy Perry is how she loves what she does and she is very courageous in going out and sharing that, her music with thousands and millions of people. And I thought, if I can do that, if I can teach, thousands, well, I've done that, but millions of people how to design their life and through that, how to think like a designer, have these principles and really um, design their life and work. My uh, goal in life would be accomplished. So um, the good news is the book has been translated into multiple languages and thousands of people have designed their life. Uh, the youngest is 13 and all the way to 90. And I get notes from people telling me, well, this has transformed my life, just like what Sohrab said in the beginning. And that those little cues that design does transform your life. And in this case, this is pure design. It's you and your life and a design process. There are no intermediary products or apps or services. It is you know, as pure design thinking as you can get. And that really is my goal and mission. And last couple of slides are about what happened through COVID. Um, in an interesting way, you know, often in design, constraints are the opportunity. So COVID came, became an opportunity to take this to many people at the same time. So we uh, started a virtual tea, which we do every Wednesday at 5 p.m. And um, Sohrab will put the links to our newsletter. And if you subscribe to our newsletter, you can get the invites to, the, um, to every event that we do. But this is an event that we do um, that's free. And it's really um, taking an exercise every week and thinking about it together with this community for an hour. And it's so, it's a beautiful community of people and they actually rename the virtual teas authenticity. So it is authenticity, city being like, this is the city where, or a space where we are authentic. And um, they named me the mayor. So I'm the mayor of authenticity. Um, and we also, our clients have come back to us, Philips being one of them and said, well, could we do this with our global team so that they can, you know, th this is a way for our teams to get connected through COVID, which we've done. Um, we've also taken, we're, um, you know, great believers in co-design with end users as 
an amazing design tool, research tool. So we've been co-designing with end users uh, many different things. So this is our uh, work from home co-design session for one of our clients, Hayworth. And to be able to, like, we've learned how to do this online now, which is, uh, which allows us to uh, become incredibly global. Um, we also started salons around topics that we're interested in. So one topic is that we're interested in is women designers designing for women. And here are some amazing people. This was one of our salons. So again, if you're interested in this, just sign up to the newsletter. But you might recognize some names. Debbie Millman uh, from Design Matters, for example, is an amazing person. Um, Margot Georgiadis was the CEO of Ancestry.com and Mattel. Uh, Patrice is um, working on, Patrice Martin is working on caregiving in the 21st century. Um, and then last but not least, this is where our work is going. It's about not only design the life you love, but design the X you love. So this is a new tool that we've developed and we're um, uh, rolling it out where everybody can use the same process, deconstruction, reconstruction, but choose the topic. So you can do design the work you love, design the summer you love, design the uh, uh, you know, relationship you love. And it's a process that takes two hours and you go from designing the ex you love to writing a manifesto about it to then writing an action plan. And then we follow that up with accountability uh, partners so that you can practice it daily and change your behavior. And on that note, uh, just to give you a kind of idea of like, it went from design the life you love to design the ex you love. I'll open it up, but. The, these are the um, circles of the project and the influence. And it starts with you. So I just want to remind you that my goal is to have you all be the users of your life and work and the X, whatever X that you choose. Um, so for example, Sohrab, for your uh, wife, it's des design the dentist life you love or the dentist office you love. Um, but really making sure that you don't forget this is maybe one of the few opportunities where the user is you. It's not the end user is not somebody else. This is you. And you, once you give yourself permission, that's where great things happen. When once you give yourself permission to be the user of your life and any subset of your life. All right. Not too bad, right? So, Rob, we have like 15, 20 minutes for Q&A. That's okay. Absolutely okay. <laughs> so, um, while others are uh, thinking about uh, potential questions to ask, I already have some. Um, All right. As I mentioned already, uh, for, my, for my wife, this was uh, a pretty good experience going through that book. And I have three kids, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a nine-year-old. And I was thinking to myself, at what point does it make sense to engage these kind of conversations with them? And uh, how would you start that? And I assume you having three kids of your own, you've probably, you do have some experience in that area. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, Sohra, with three kids who are under 10, uh, you, you are very courageous and um, you, you need to kind of recognize that they're designing your life and your wife's life. So <laughs> that I know, that I know. <laughs> but it's, um, that's a great question. So I find that a lot of parents actually give the book um, to their kids and um, in it, because it's a very visual book and because kids are not afraid of making mistakes, they can really, even like you start using it as a coloring book. So it would be a great experiment to give your three kids the book and see how they respond to it. But here's what I've done with my family. Um, I've taken my kids um, to my sessions and I remember when Awa, who's now 17, 
when Awa came to my session, she was nine years old. She sat next to me, did all the exercises diligently. And at the end where I go around the, um, you know, at the time when we did these things in person, I go around the table and I ask everyone, so what's the life you love? Awa looked at everyone and looked at me and said, the life I love is doing what my mother tells me to do. And I was like, <laughs> so that's what happens when you're nine years old. Um, so the, and I, I love that. And I can tell you, of course, now at 17, she has a very different idea of designing her life. <laughs> Thank God. Um, but it, um, the youngest people that I've done it with are middle school students. The best age I would say to start in earnest is high school students. Um, and I've done it with high school students. And the reason I say that it's because we want to design our life. I would say, you know, don't design your life if things are going really well, because why deconstruct something that's more or less working, right? Because once you deconstruct something, let me tell you, it's not gonna go back the way it was before. And it's not a negative thing because, but deconstruction breaks your preconceptions, your biases and gets you to think differently, which is great. But you wanna, as a designer, you don't want to fix something that's not broken. You want to problem solve. So designing anything is, um, when, you, when you're like ready to make a change. Um, so maybe you've been at a certain company for a long time and like usually five years is the S curve where you've gathered like enough expertise that you're starting to repeat yourself and you're bored. Um, that might be a good time to design the project I love or design the next role I love, even within your own company, right? You don't have to, like that doesn't mean that you have to look for new work, but you can, um, you're like, okay, I'm ready for new responsibilities and this would be an amazing tool. Um, so a long winded answer, Sohrab, is I think the, a good age is um, the, kind of like a warm up, maybe at 13, but then more like 15, 16, 17. Okay. Okay. And then making it maybe a, a, a habit, like a life habit, right? Yeah, and so not doing it once, but looking at it on a continuous basis. And because, I mean, you're, you're, whatever thing you come up with when you go through this process is also going to take you some time to get there. Yeah. And as you're getting there, you probably realize that some of the aspects that you were thinking would be great yeah. or maybe not, and some other things might be great. So I think maybe it's similar to product development, a constant thing. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you prototype it and then you, you test the prototype and then you go back to it. And a lot of people I know um, keep their books or their notebooks uh, and then go back to it. And some people use it for New Year's resolutions. Like they make a habit of doing it towards the end of the year and then looking at, at it again. And then design the X you love as a tool, um, I think has brought an incredible efficiency to it where um, I'm now trying it where I can like do it in a short amount of time, like in half an hour, once I know the process um, and ask like very simple questions. And simple questions, for example, it's um, one of the things that I recently designed is um, design the summer I love. And it's a very like, it's this, it sounds like a fluffy idea, but it was very interesting. Like it's a, it gives you tools to have a moment of self-reflection. So that's the kind of like the, the big and the small, right? Life is the big umbrella or work is the big umbrella, but then everything we do is a subset of that. So you, and design the X you love gives you that efficiency and speed. Yeah. yeah because it gives, it gives you practice with, with the tool and the, and the process. Now uh, we started with, uh, or my first question was about kids. Uh, you also work with a ton of leaders. 
Now, yeah. my assumption is, and I might be wrong, so correct me on that, that organ the leaders in organizations come to you with regards to, okay, how can I design the organization that I love? Yeah. And how do you approach them? And do you have a few experiences to share? Absolutely. I mean, we've worked with companies like um, Colgate Palmolive, uh, worked with Tiffany and Co. Uh, we've worked with um, Amazon in like subsets uh, with, with um, Converse in helping them define like, do you want to the Harvard Business Review? And the, the topics range from design the team you love to design the excellence you love, to uh, design the new business or um, entrepreneur's life I love. You know, um, we've worked with entrepreneurs who are in the process of developing um, their startup. And so, and every one of them uses the same process, but what you put at the center of it makes a whole world of difference. And it allows us to, what I love about design thinking is you never ask a direct question. You know, for example, the hero's exercise is about unleashing your values, but I'm not going to ask you, what are your values? Even though that's maybe the most important thing that I want to ask you, I'm going to ask you, who are your heroes? And it's really about creating a safe space in which people feel like they're playing, but where the end result is incredibly um, powerful and it allows to develop, um, you know, for people to connect with, with their vulnerabilities, like we just did, you know, you talk about superpowers, kryptonites, it's about recognizing your expertise and your vulnerability and from that letting you move towards collaboration so those kinds that to me that's the beauty of design thinking is it gets you to think about things differently and you feel like you're being creative but at the same time it gets you to your emotional and intellectual core and helps you develop a shared mental model so my goal is when we do this with leaders i should say their goal is to get their whole team involved so that the team feels like I am contributing to this leadership vision. And then it creates the incredible conversations. And from that, people are able to write their team manifestos, develop their team action plans, and then set up um, roles and responsibilities and then accountability partners. So it just, you know, um, and it's, again, it's the idea that all of that at the end of the day is a subset of your life. Mm. And that's why the tools are so accessible. But like if you're designing the team you love, that team is a big part of your life, right? And that Absolutely. I want people to have joy in that, you know, it um, to, you know, isn't that better to create a team or an organization that brings you joy? So I'll stop talking, but I just wanted to say the, the use of the word love is very intentional in this um, framework. Yeah. And people in the beginning were telling me like, ah, I, we don't know if corporations want to talk about love. I'm like, well, the, the, right, the good ones that realize what we're doing is so, you know, corporations are made up of human beings and they all want to connect to what gives them joy we're keeping love in there and the ones that don't get love you know this is not the right tool yeah so for me it was always two words that are very strong in this thing one is the first one design and the and the second one is the last one the love and you, you talked about the love i think that the first one the design makes it very clear that this is an active process where you yeah. have to play an active role so if you as an organization team leader whatever a team member Think about designing the team, the organization, whatever you love. It makes, at least for me, it's always like, okay, there's something I need to do about that. And uh, not, not by myself. It's a co-creation co process, but um, I think this active piece is important. So let's take an, a question from, from the audience. Ingrid is asking, 
What if you're getting signs from the universe, whatever that is, that you should change something, but you're not sure about that? Would you still recommend to design this new change? I, I love that. Ingrid, what a great question. And really the answer is, why don't you try it? You know, maybe get the book and try a couple first steps. Um, because what I love about design is it's all about um, permutations of ideas and having a process to develop those permutations, right? Um, so you can kind of go through the process a little bit and see if it helps you think. And then if you feel like actually now that you're like deconstructing your biases and it's really helping you think and the, the, this change is exciting to you, then go through the whole thing. If you feel like, you know what, this change is not gonna be constructive and I'm not gonna, maybe the timing is not right, then close the book. And that's the beauty of design anyway. It's really like, um, it's a process. It's a notebook or an iPad and a pen and you permit, you know, you create permutations of ideas. If it excites you and rises to the top, great. If it doesn't, yay, turn the page. I hope that's helpful. Yes, uh, I thank you for your answer. Uh, actually, my my point is that uh, I, I like what I'm doing right now, but uh, it's, it's like puzzle that you are just talking about this design thinking that I recently uh, went through the training and uh, also design thinking sprint. And yesterday one uh, colleague asked me if I don't know something about UX design, uh, like user experience design, that they are looking for designer. And I Googled like, what is this? And now I'm like, you are talking about this design. It's like puzzle for me that put together. And now I'm like, I don't know if I should go this way. Probably Again, to be explored yeah. then. I, I think so, yeah. And you know, the thing with the, the other thing about design is you, my expertise in design. So I always frame things within that expertise in when you're designing anything, a product, let's say, right? You make a quick model, like the minimum viable product you make it out of paper, you, you sketch it with pen and pencil, and you kind of like take that and you talk to a couple of people and see as you talk to them, is this, does this idea have legs? And then you bring in collaborators and then you, know, you go to the next prototype and you make, make something maybe a little bit more durable. And so it's the same process of like, you use the process to you know, get the idea out of your head, really, onto paper, outside of yourself, then talk to people about it. And then I think from that, you'll see if um, it, the process will take you where it needs to take you. And then as you talk to people, if you feel like, you know, you're either going to be really excited by it, and then you're going to figure out how you can solve for it or you're not going to be excited by it and then you're going to be like you know i'm fine <laughs> so i basically have nothing to lose <laughs> nothing to sorry lose. okay thank you guys yeah. thank you Aisha, being conscious of time we're at yeah. the end of our time box uh thank you so much again for for being so generous with your time i love the concept of uh, knowledge philanthropy and you have demonstrated this today. Thank you so much. Um, have a great day in New York. Have a great weekend. And I hope to reconnect with you very soon. So Rob, thank you so much. It was great doing this together with you. I love that you connected it to knowledge philanthropy. Now you made me feel like uh, with, with a great way to come out of my week. And it's great meeting everyone. So um, please, Either email me if you're interested in more. Uh, and Sohrab, you, I think, put in the um, link to the book. Get the book. 
or sign up to my newsletter, which will mean that you'll know what we're up to, um, especially like the next design, the X you love session or the T. Um, and we're actually going to do the tea on um, summertime. So it'll be more Europe friendly hours because I'm going to do it from Turkey. So you might want to check that out. It's like you, a great group of people. Um, and we, we network and we s support each other. So on that note, thank you so much. This was lovely for me. Thank you, Aisha. Have a great time. Bye. Thank you, Sohrab.